just continuing on from uh, Mary Ann's story, I've actually tasted Heidi's fruit tarts and they are beautiful. <laughs> in fact, I've stayed in Heidi's home and it was a real pleasure to uh, be there and, and um, see Heidi go out in the morning, out to do her book evangelism and uh, that was really special. And uh, this morning, as we can see, uh, Mary Ann's not too well there with her, with her um, crutches. But we've had uh, a sad uh, news this morning that um, Heidi's, uh, Mary Ann's mum, Heidi, has, uh, is in hospital in a serious condition. So if we could uh, remember her in our prayers as uh, we go through this coming week. We invite those to kneel as we seek a Heavenly Father in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we come here this morning with open hearts as we've just been singing. We just have our hearts open for your blessing today, for your word that Jordan is going to bring to us. We pray that it will mean something special to us today that we'll go away from here being changed, that we'll focus on you and that we'll love you more. We're so grateful, Lord, for the sacrifice that you made on Calvary for each one of us, the forgiveness of our sins, Lord, and we just pray again for your forgiveness this morning. Pray you'll strengthen us that we might be overcomers, that we might focus on you, we might be able to share your love with those we come in contact with. Again, Lord, we just want to thank you that we can be here to praise your wonderful name again today. There are some, Lord, that aren't here for various reasons. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll be close to them today and that they will remember that this is your, this is your special day. Father, we pray for Jordan again as he brings your word to us today. Give him the words to speak and that, uh, again, that we'll have open hearts and receive your word for us today we just pray Lord for our young folk too they find the way hard Lord and we just pray that you'll be close to them at this time give them strength to continue in your ways Father again we just want to thank you again for your many blessings and we just pray Lord that your presence will be right here in our midst this morning and that we will always be faithful to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Church. <clears throat> I am thankful for the turn in the weather. It's uh, been a long week of a lot of rain. But we're thankful the Lord blessed us with some beautiful sunshine today. Um, Wade, I just want to say thank you for coming. I just want to give you a personal thank you. It's good to see you here. And um, did you guys have a good week this week? I had, I had a good week. You know, the Lord, He's so good. And um, I was able to have a Bible study with a gentleman this week um, as a result from our Great Controversy Project that we've been passing out books um, over the past uh, few months. And uh, we had, it was my second Bible study with a gentleman up in Hikarangi. And uh, 
um, is able to, to show to him through Scripture the, the reliability of the Scriptures that show them that there is something special about this book and that there is an urgent message for the days we're living in right now. And, and he can see that, he, said, he told me. He can see that. And uh, it's just exciting to see how the Spirit of God is opening up people's hearts in the days we're living in right now. Um, Jamie and I, we went out door knocking this week and, and we shared some, some more great controversies. And uh, we had some, some neat experiences. Hey, Jamie? You know, being invited into homes. Um, people saying, this is what we need. You know, they didn't have time to talk with us right now. But they wanted the book. They're wanting to read. They're searching. And uh, it's just exciting to see and exciting to be a part of it. Um, as was said, this is one of my last sermons I'll be preaching here. Uh, at the end of this month, I'll be heading back to Canada. But I just want to say thank you for uh, welcoming me into your church family, um, making me feel like I belong and be able to take part in, in your, your ministry here. And I just thank you for that. But as we start this morning, I just want to offer one more word of prayer as we open the Word of God. So please bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we're thankful that we can come into your presence, that we can boldly approach the throne of grace. And Jesus, I want to do that now. I need an extra portion of your grace. I need an extra portion of power and strength. Lord, because there's a message that needs to be shared and there's someone here that needs to hear it. And I pray that you can use this, this lisping and stammering tongue to preach the word of life to someone here this morning. So Lord, pour out your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our message this morning is entitled, Follow the Leader. Follow the Leader. Um, as a little boy, there was a game that I used to play that uh, my house was right across the street from a schoolyard. And in this schoolyard, there was a, a jungle gym. And I don't know what you guys would call it here. Do you guys call those jungle gyms here? Where kids play on them. There's slides, there's monkey bars, there's zip lines that you can swing along. This was, like, cool. We loved to play on this. So when I would get home from school, I didn't attend that particular school, but when I would get home from school, first thing I would do is I'd drop my books and go to the schoolyard to play on the jungle gym. And some of the neighborhood kids, we'd gather together, and we would play this game called Follow the Leader. We had different names for that, but that was the most common name. It was Follow the Leader. And we had these different obstacles we'd have to do. First, we would pick the leader, and uh, we would follow him. Quite simple, really. <laughs> and we would follow this, this person, whoever it was. We would take turns being the leader, and we would have to go up the slide backwards. You know? and then we'd go across the monkey bars, or hang on the zip line with one arm. And the leader was the one in charge. And if you weren't doing what the leader did, if you weren't exactly imitating what he did, you're out of the game. And, you know, uh, the person that could imitate the leader the most, he would, he would win. And it's quite interesting that this little game that I played as a boy, I found a lot of spiritual lessons within it and a lot of s biblical examples. And we'll look at those in a moment. It's interesting to see what people follow in this world today. It's quite interesting. A few years ago, four or five years ago, a movie came out called Transformers. And there was a, uh, a car in this movie. It was a yellow Camaro. I understand. And um, this car was apparently an attractive car. I kind of like it. It's a, it's a good-looking car. And um, that year, after that movie came out, sales for that particular car, painted in yellow, skyrocketed. Camaro 
hadn't been the number one sports car for 24 years. But that year, when that movie came out, it became number one. Camaro passed Chevy, uh, sorry, Camaro passed the Mustang car by over 10,000 sales in America that year. It's quite interesting, I thought, that what people see, they like to imitate. They saw that, that on that movie, that the guy who got the girl who had the nice car, you know, everything seemed to work out for him. And sales skyrocketed. What are you following today? What is your example? People follow fashions. People follow movie stars, politicians, role models. But what is your leader today? Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 85. Sorry, let's look at Psalms 89 first, then we'll go to Psalms 85. Psalms chapter 89. Psalms 89, and we're looking at verse 14. Are we there? All right, here we go. Psalms 89 verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Whose throne is that? God, right? Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Where you find righteousness and justice, mercy, and truth, who is there? God. Okay, let's go over to Psalms chapter 85. Psalms 85, and we're looking at verse 10. The Bible says here, mercy and truth have met together. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Now, this is kind of weird. It's kind of intimate. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Mercy and truth. And we just read in Psalms 89 verse 14 where we find mercy and truth and righteousness. Who is there? It's God. And here where we see this, this beautiful example of all those three things. When did that happen? When did righteousness and peace kiss? When did mercy and truth meet together? And we find that at the cross. In their sacrifice at the cross, Ellen White says that's where mercy and truth, that's where righteousness and peace kissed. Continuing on, verse 11. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our Lord will yield its in, our land, sorry, will yield its increase. Now catch this. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. Do you see this imagery here where righteousness is blazing a trail? making righteousness path, righteousness footsteps, our pathway. Who is our righteousness? Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ, the righteousness. And where Jesus goes, he creates a pathway for his followers to walk in. Quickly, let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 58, and we'll see something similar there. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58, and we're going to read there just, just verse 8. Isaiah 58 and verse 8. <clears throat> Are we there? Here are a few pages turning. Isaiah 58 and verse 8. It says, Then your light shall break forth as the morning, 
and thine health shall spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness shall go before thee. And what? The glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward or thy rear guard. Now I want to look at that there for a moment. What is a rearward or rear guard? Well, in the army, a rear guard is simply that. Those that protect from behind. It's a certain... Uh, a battalion or whatever that would protect the, protect the army from behind. And here we see this in Scripture, that the glory of God is our rear guard. Let's read Isaiah 58, 8 again. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness, who's that? Jesus and Jesus shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy rear guard. If Jesus is going before you, and the glory of the Lord is your rear guard, where are you? Right in the middle, right? Right in the middle. Do you see this imagery here of following the leader? The safest place to be, friends, is in the center of God's will. And that puts Jesus in front of you and God's glory behind you and you're following Jesus. Let's see more clearly what it means to follow the leader. We understand that Jesus, our righteousness, is our leader. What does it mean to follow him? What does it mean to practically follow Jesus? Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalms, or sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. When you get there, I'll tell you a little story. 1 Peter chapter 2. I like analogies because it helps paint the picture in my mind. And uh, sometimes God shows me through my daily experience um, what the Bible means to me. And uh, are you there in 1 Peter chapter 2? My first car was a three-cylinder Chevy Sprint. And um, it was about 20 years old. And it was, had only one previous owner. And it was a lady, and she had smoked every single day of her life in that car that she owned it for the last 20 years. It was quite a disgusting, but it was my car, and it was my first car. And I liked it. It had five gears, and I could shift, and uh, it had 12-inch wheels. Just a little buzzer, you know? And quite interestingly enough, there was the word hand-painted on the back of this car, and it was the word Buzzy. And so I called my first car Buzzy. And uh, Buzzy and I, we went everywhere. That was my first Bible-working car. Um, I brought people to evangelistic meetings in that car. I, I went and did a lot of Bible studies in that car. We had a lot of good time. We did a lot of off-roading in that car, too. And one particular winter night, I was driving home to visit my parents. And um, there was snow and ice on the road back in Canada. And there was, there was trucks that were hauling. And every time a truck would go, it would splash snow and slush into your window. And it would cover your lights. And you could hardly see in front of you. And um, if this car was to be brought to a, a warrant of fitness and its lights were examined, on a good day, it probably wouldn't pass. But on a bad day, it really wouldn't pass with snow and slush all over you. And every few minutes, you'd have to get out and wipe the lights off and so you could see the road ahead of you. It was night. And as I'd be driving along, I found the best place for me to be was with a big semi-truck right on my tail. Because I found that as the semi-truck was right on my tail, the headlights of the semi-truck would shoot right over top of my car and I could see the road ahead of me. And when I saw that, I saw Isaiah 58, verse 8. And thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord is thy rearward. 
and you're right in the middle. Do you see the picture? Do you see the picture? What does it mean to follow the leader? First Peter chapter 2, and we're going to see a little image here of our leader. Verse 21. First Peter 2 and verse 21. For to this you were called, the Bible says. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us what? Sorry, what? An example. Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. There again, we see this imagery of following the leader. That Jesus making a pathway for us. We should follow his steps. Verse 22. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. This is a picture of what our leader looks like. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit or wrong found in his mouth. Keep that in your mind. And we're going to go to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And here, as an Adventist church, we find the three angels' message. But just before that, we see a description of a group of people that go to heaven. And we often refer to this group as the 144,000. And this is where you find it, in Revelation chapter 14. It's describing how they're standing on Mount Zion... Now they're singing a new song that only the 144 could sing. And it says in verse 4 of Revelation 14, verse 4, it says, These are the ones, the 144,000, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Now, this is obviously speaking in a biblical, a symbolic language. These aren't literally virgins, but these are virgins in the fact that they haven't been defiled with the harlotry of false doctrine. We can study that more, but just briefly touching on it. These are people that were redeemed from among men. People just like you and me. But the interesting thing about these people is it says... That they followed the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth, now notice this, and in their mouth was found no deceit, for they were without, without fault before the throne. We just read in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 22, describing Jesus, who had no deceit in His mouth. And here, the 144,000, it describes them as having no deceit in their mouth. Why? Because they followed the leader. They looked at the leader. They did what the leader does. Whether it means being comfortable or uncomfortable. They did whatever the Lamb does. They followed Jesus wherever Jesus went. I was working in a little town in British Columbia, Canada, called Salmon Arm. And we were holding a, an evangelistic meeting there. And they had brought in an evangelist. And we had 30 or 40 people from the town attending this meeting. And my job as a Bible worker, I was to go and visit the people that were attending and there was this particular couple named um, Dave and Bobby. The lady's name was Bobby and the husband was Dave. And they uh, came from a, of a more uh, lower social economic background. They didn't have a lot of money. And uh, they wouldn't give me their home address to come visit them because they, they felt embarrassed because their house was a mess and they didn't want me to come there. I said, that's fine. I said, where can I meet you guys? They said, well, Thursday mornings, I'm at the sec we're at the second harvest. And the second harvest was a food bank that they would go and get some free food every week on Thursday mornings. I said, fine, I'll be there. 
And so Thursday morning, I show up there early, and they did too. They were there, camped out, sitting at the front door to be sure that they were the first ones to get in. They, they had done this before. And so I was talking with Bobby and Dave. And as I was, this um, native gentleman was sitting there too. And he was obviously uh, intoxicated. And he began to kind of yell at me and, and, what are you doing? Why are you talking to these people? And uh, I was trying to have a discussion with, with Dave and Bobby. And I said, I turned to him, I said, sir, what's your name? He says, Tom. I said, hi, Tom, how are you doing? I'm fine. But you white people need to get off our land. I said, I don't want to go into this. I'm, I'm talking with, with Dave and Bobby here. And I said, oh, I'm, have, have a good day, sir. And I was just trying to be polite. And he starts getting all anxious and upset at me for some reason. And uh, I finished my discussion with Dave and Bobby. And this man, as I start to walk away, he starts yelling out to me. He says, don't you walk away from me. Don't you walk away from me. I want to talk to you. And uh, he's getting quite angry. And I'm like, ugh. I keep walking and finally says, I want to talk to you. And so I turn around. About 99% of me wanted me to keep walking. But I listened to the 1% and I turned around. And he walks up right to my face. And he gets up right in my face. And he was a bit taller than me. He was a big man. And he says, I want to talk to you. I said, I'm here. Let's talk. He says, and his angry face just melted. He says, I want to commit suicide. And he starts to cry. I said, Tom, let's talk. So we go and sit down in a, in a seat there outside the building. And he starts to give me a story of, of rejection from friends and family, of losing jobs and, and where he's found himself today. And he says, I don't, there's nothing worth living for anymore. I want to die. And I said, Tom, there's, there's more hope. And I was able to pray with him and share him some, some scripture and give him a Bible. And the next day I saw him walking on the street. But I tell you what, friends, when you make the decision to follow the leader, sometimes it leads you into uncomfortable situations. But I tell you what, just like when the righteousness of God is before you and the glory of the Lord is your rear guard, it is the safest place for you to be is in the center of God's will, whether it's standing in a very angry situation, very uncomfortable situation, it is the best place for you to be. It's the safest place for you to be. So practically, walking in the footsteps of Jesus, number one rule in, in this game of follow the leader is simply this follow the leader. Rule number two in this game, follow the leader, is to do as the leader does. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. What does our leader do? Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9, and we're going to read verses 10 through 13. Matthew 9, starting in verse 10. The Bible says, Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. The low life, they come and sit down with Jesus. That's what the Bible's saying here. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does this teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have what? Have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Rule number two in follow the leader is to do as the leader does. Jesus got involved with people. 